you very much. Uh, when you described the experience of motion or the attraction also of the effects of, uh, of violence, I was thinking also about uh, the how people perpetrating violence, how they uh, describe the, the flow and the rush of this situation and the uh, something that could be described also as autotelic or autotelic violence that is a pleasure in itself to to act violently is this how can this be differentiated from the sublime or is this also a form of the sublime is it only in the defense situation or is it also in the attack uh, situation uh, no, well, I, I think probably both. Um, obviously, um, uh, we're meant to have an ethical investment in the defense rather than the offense um, moment. Um, I think that um, the sublime is something that that is um, an immensely satisfying and gratifying um, experience if we think about it in those terms and I think that you know um, there are people who obviously just want to wreak violence for that thrill for that that kind of visceral um, thrill um, I think that it's it's less but but I think that we've already moved into a kind of moralistic judgmental world because the the sublime is in most um, theoretical treatments of the concept it's a strictly kind of um individual experience i climb the mountain i sit at the top of the mountain and reflect on surviving or i go out in the storm and i survive the storm and go wow or i spar and i win so in in the kind of in the more contemporary readings of the romantic and post-romantic theorizations of the sublime it's always been about the 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 confirmation of the subject, like the confirmation of the Western man who who has this strong identity and can conquer nature and so on. So I think a question like that is is maybe a sort of second order thing. Like we start to decide, well, uh, we start to make decisions about whether um, it's it's right to enjoy violence. Um, and that there's a very interesting. Um, well, I have a I have a sense. Um, that there is a time where it's culturally allowed to say that you enjoyed violence. If you look at, say, news stories or journalistic treatments of like women who did a self-defense course, and there's a long, like a long, like opinion piece in like the Guardian or, or something like that, the woman who is resolutely pacifist and doesn't know anything about violence spends a, a day or two on this self-defense course and then they go wow i really found myself starting to enjoy this and you would go yay women are allowed to like finally you know recover their sense of agency but if a man were to do that i think that we would go hang on a minute uh there's a there's a problem here so i think your question is very interesting and it opens out onto all sorts of ethical and moral judgments thank you First question. Yeah, I, I have a, a long list of questions. I will try to give only one or two. Um, because I, I have been doing uh, practicing martial arts for, for a long time, been uh, practicing karate in my youth, and have now been doing uh, historical European martial arts for like 12 or 13 years, and have been an instructor for sword fighting classes for four or five years. And so there's a rich tradition of martial arts that don't have this orientalistic end because they're not Asian-inspired martial arts. Um, but uh, in your talk, you said you wanted to go, you wanted to go away from this orientalist view, but at the same time you only talked about those martial arts when for example, boxing is a very non-orientalist martial arts, or catch wrestling, or Irish stick <laughs> fighting, or the whole range of, of European traditions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that, I mean, that interests me. So it, it, it's, what, it, it's interesting um, the way in which 
there, there is a, a huge um, array of what we would today call martial arts. You know, everything that knights did in training, everything that you practice in, in historical European martial arts. And it wasn't spiritualized um, in, in any intense way. I mean, there were certain things that knights did, like vigils, where they would they, they would they'd have to stay uh, awake and basically what we might now call kind of meditating for for prolonged periods of time, but it wasn't spiritualized um, in uh, any great way until um, until the the era of Asian martial arts became immensely popular in the nineteen seventies, and that's a hugely Tenacious. I mean, the 1970s is quite a long time ago now. And so there's a whole species of martial practices that are resolutely Orientalist. Um, and I'm interested in I'm interested in the tenacity of the hold on those and their relationship with these kind of non-Orientalist self-defense practices. Um I can't. I haven't really thought about HEMA. I don't really know a lot about um, the discourses around historical European martial arts, um, but I'm interested specifically in that cluster of practices that are we would call them Asian martial arts, such as your karate and everything. I mean, I would be interested to know what what you think, because if you've got a lot of questions, you've probably got a hypothesis as well. I mean, what 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 would your position on that be? Um. So from experience, I can say when I started in HEMA, it was a lot of people who had done Asian-inspired martial arts, haven't found them, haven't found what they were searching for in the martial arts there, and were were very hostile to to this idea that martial arts has to have a philosophy or has to have something religious. And there was a lot of uh, anti-Asian. Uh, martial arts sentiment, like there was this whole discourse about how the European long sword is in every aspect supreme over the katana, how European wrestling styles are better than Asian wrestling styles because every minute that the Japanese are spending on meditating, we are spending on actually training how to throw people on the ground head first. Yeah. Uh, but that was in the beginning when, when it still was a kind of a young new sport and, and now there are just many people whose, whose first martial art ever will be Kima and just yeah. joining to have fun or to beat each other with swords without having to meditate first. Yeah. I guess I, I guess then to, to take another pass at your 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 interest is I'm not I'm what I'm interested in is the treatment in these different discourses, if we have, say, Asian martial arts, which will tend to orientalize, and they'll go, oh, that's Mushin, or that's Dao, or that, or something like that. And then you have these more secular, shall we just say secular, kind of, or pragmatic martial arts, and th the treatment of these same moments. So in the Rory Miller um, quotations, where he talks about these moments that could be really heavily philosophized. He just refuses to do that and go, oh, it's just a job. But uh, and it just, I don't know how it happened. It was like magic. It's technically impossible for me to do this. And yet it happened. So I'm interested in the difference between the treatment of these, what are effectively kind of the same moments. You know what I mean? The, 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 so it's not that I'm, I know more about the, the Asian martial arts and the discourse of Asian martial arts, but I'm interested in the different treatment of the, what we might call the same event or the same affect, the same amazing moment of perfection or intensity. So, yeah, that's thank you. That's a very helpful and interesting question for me. Thank you. I mean, in, in HEMA, you, you have, on the one hand, you have the, the sources, who are like a couple of hundred years old. On the other hand, you have modern people training it. So you will have different answers to this question. But like uh, the situation that you described with the prison guard could be described with Mushin, but it also very neatly fits a passage from one of the longsword sources, which is that whatever happens in the fight, it should be your will, your, you know, your tempo, you, you're breaking the other person to your rhythm and not 
just reacting to that. Yeah, I'd like. I, I would like to look into more of the say HEMA um, and the fight books and, and so on and, and these authors to find out the way that they might treat these kind of moments of intensity. There's not a lot of psychology in these early self-defense books, I've noticed. Like now it's all about the psychology, pre-conflict tension and the freeze, fight or flight. But until about the, the 1970s, there was none of that. It was just like, you just have to need to learn out the box and wrestle and use the staff and you're fine. Anyway. I think your talk was also on the rhetorics and the poetics of uh, of fighting, of violence, and reacting to violence and self defense. So, how is it represented, uh, literally in words and in texts, and also in the films? That's, that's something different from the experience or, or the action that. The, Right. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, definitely. Sorry, find another question. I agree. Yes, but another question, please. Yes, yes, of course. Please. Yeah, maybe I can follow on you, Bana, because I have a more personal question. Um, I'm thank you for your talk, and I'm curious about the gender elaborations that you have in relation to your topic. And um, like seven, eight years ago, I took some jujitsu classes. And I was then in that time period, like I had a like a, a harassment situation on the street, and that was one of the very rare times that I had a physical uh, reaction to such a situation. And I had a maybe moment of mushi, which didn't end up with a subline feeling because I was not so successful. I mean, not so bad, but I also, you know, I. We both fell, so I, I, I took some proud of it, but you know, I feel like that is also a moment of sort of this contagious violence because I didn't want it and I actually was not really, I took maybe few classes and I had this sort of maybe a falsified idea of empowerment, so like not like that uh, text of Guardian or so. Um, so I still have a very like Mm, rather negative effects from this encounterment, and so I'm curious about how you elaborate like this gender issues. And because you also showed many like this like, orientalist, but not only orientalist, sort of male wisdom figure, and yeah, maybe we have like Kill Bill in, in this popular example. But mm -hmm. okay, yeah, that, thank you for that. I can't see you. The camera's just. I think that you're. I, you're just off screen. I can't. I can see your hand. <laughs> so, that's okay. I know it's not essential, but hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I did. I haven't. I didn't touch on gender issues, and I didn't um, touch on the messiness of so many real um, violent situations because I was. I'm focusing mainly on the training. Um, so my, my, my own research, uh, like, I mean, what you describe or what you gesture towards uh, is a situation that I think many of us could relate to, regardless of, of gender, maybe, where, where we have, we've been in an ugly situation and it doesn't become beautiful in any way and there's no satisfactory resolution to it and, and there's been violence and there's, yeah, um, and, and, that will change you um, and that's not a sublime experience at all or it, it or maybe there's a different way of I don't want to say everything is the sublime right I'm not gonna this is not my new concept and I, therefore the sublime fits every scenario and every psychological situation and every representation um, but I'm more I, I, I'm I could answer this in lots of ways, uh, and one of the one of the points that um, Rory Miller makes repeatedly is that most of the training that martial artists do and call it self defense is probably more dangerous for the person in terms of what they believe, what they come to believe about violence and their own capacities, 
and it's like we, we you know some people think that you go to the dojo you go to the training hall and it's like a laboratory and you go and you learn these things and for other people well it's more like a soft play area where you go and live out your fantasies about about your own potency and i think that that's not a, a gender issue i think it's a it's a problem it's a question of training like rory miller basically says that for most people no training is better because if you're trained, you might try and do stupid things like fine motor skills, joint locks, wrist locks. You might try and jab someone in the eye, but you've lost all of those skills because the chemicals that are coursing through your body won't allow you to do that correctly. So it's it's actually, it makes your fighting ability worse to have some skilled martial arts training. Whereas someone who's just angry and furious... Um, will probably will do much much better however when it comes to gender i think that martial arts and self defense training is potentially emancipatory i believe this is also like we're going to have to bracket this off this isn't my academic uh, position on this but my personal opinion on this is that like all girls should learn jiu jitsu because it levels the playing field to a, an enormous degree practically pragmatically but um, the flip side of that is that um, if men learn jujitsu, then that just redresses the balance again in, in exactly the same way. But that's my own personal kind of practitioner, not my um, reflexive kind of scholarly take on it all. My more, more kind of reflexive take on it all is that training satisfies many things and it can assuage a lot of fears and it can um, therapeutically manage um, certain issues that people have doesn't necessarily translate in the ability to either dispense or withstand violence um, so I, I mean we could talk about this uh, have I answered any of that or, or... <laughs> that, <that's fine. laughs> Alex Sophia um, it's really um, it's very talk and um, I have so many points that I, that I don't want to <laughs> not ask. Um, uh, one of them, I want to ask all of them, but I, I won't, don't worry. Um, I have one idea, um, uh, taking up the question, of course, of the sublime. I really liked your, your sentence, sublime, as an effect, and this effect helps account for the non-violent attraction for violence. I think this is really strong. And I was just thinking now, listening to Ishil and you, um, that uh, the, the self, uh, you were also pointing out the effect of self care, and um, uh, which is, in my view, a very time specific um, question and the contemporary form of the self of self care is um, today another one than. No, in the seventies, for instance, um, and I thought that um, this relates probably very closely that today the sublime has another value for this self that we care so much for, specific self. So it's it's a very uh, contemporary analysis uh, that you. Um, that yeah. I mean, I, I, that's I know, that might not be your question yet. That's a statement. But um, uh, if you, um, how to say this? Arguably, the the real high point of interest in the sublime was during the Romantic period, which was also the period of the Industrial Revolution and mass urbanization. And so, the Romantic poets, for instance, and the the Romantic philosophers were valuing nature and these profound events because they were fearful of the the kind of the effects of of industrial urbanization and modernity and then if we if we fast forward and flip to like to 2000 1999 2000 and you look at a film like fight club or you look at the novel fight club which came out about before that that's that is arguably about the kind of what someone like Frederick Jameson might have called the waning of affects. You know, that it's about like how do we how do we re encounter intense experience 
which is what Fight Club is, is, is all about, the intensity of experience. And that gets flipped in the film and in the novel into this kind of masculinist discourse of, of like, you know, the modern world has made us soft and made us like pampered in, in cotton wool and consumerists. And then that is called, that is feminized. So like the discourse of Tyler Durden, you know, Brad Pitt in, in the film is, is very, very misogynistic, but, but, consumerism is femini is feminization in the film nonetheless before we get to that point and then the kind of fascist militia that he builds right this terrorist kind of group the point of the starting point of fight club is like where is my reality where is the intensity and 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 kind of powerful experience that will ground me in some way and give me something and help me find myself and that's what the notion of the sublime has always been about really it's about like i go into the wilderness and i have these ex or i fight or i reject consumerism and live in a cave or something um and and find the truth to my being and i guess that's what that's what the sublime is about it's about intense affective experience and and that's not necessarily gendered and i also think that well i could say we could say lots about this but discourses or this is interests me is the resurgence of orientalism in the wake of covid19 so during the pandemic you start to see the emergence of practices like not so much yoga but qigong and Tai Chi, especially Qigong, as these like, get in touch with nature, get in touch with yourself, get in touch with your Qi and your chakras and all of this kind of stuff. And it's always about this kind of visceral, physical encounter with the real. And that's very often orientalized, but not always, but orientalism sells. Um, so yeah, I feel like I'm maybe rambling now and I feel like you didn't even get a chance to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, it's exactly that um, what I like. What I thought is this um, um, time-specific or contemporary search for a self that has spirit, spiritual um, um, that needs spiritual care, and which is, I mean, I guess, nevertheless, class-specific, religious-specific, and. Um, uh, in very 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 interesting, but um, and I was I was thinking um, about another film, not a documentary film, by Frederick Wiseman um, from 2010, Boxing Gym. I don't know if you know that. Where we have I watch it and tell me if there's <laughs> some sublime um, experience. I, I wonder, but my question is, um, how do you um, analyze this this Somehow, border work, um, this this um, work in the in, in um, Roy Miller's um, uh, writings that you this line that he draws between the real world and martial arts from an everyday um, um, analysis perspective, martial arts is real too, um, of course, and from your perspective too. But what does it help him to draw this line so? Um, so strongly. Uh, this would be my question for this text. Okay. Yeah. It's so. Um, maybe I've misrepresented uh, Rory Miller. It's actually the PDF of that book is you can find it online. I'm not sure if I'm breaking the law in telling you that. You can just download the PDF, type in the title, and there it is. But um, he doesn't argue. He doesn't have make the the sharp distinction between like between fake and real. What he talks about is like radical contextuality, um, you know. So almost like <laughs> if I am in my jujitsu club, right, and some guy comes in and says, "Hey, you, I want to fight you," and and maybe then I'll be able to use all my jujitsu, right? As long as, and, but but that that isn't what happens. What happens is the reality of the situation is much more like the kind of. Inspector Clouseau situation in the Pink Panther films, where uh, Inspector Clouseau uh, asked his asked his kind of assistant Cato to attack him when he least expects it. So that's a kind of theme through the Pink Panther films, like Clouseau is doing something and Cato attacks him. the The point is that that's actually a joke through the films, but um, but that's closer to the way that the world works. So 
if you work in a prison, then you have to train for all of the scenarios that could happen in a prison. If you're surrounded by people who want to murder you for any number of reasons. Or then the self-defense, like if, if like I live in, in this town, in these streets, I go to these places, um, I need to train for possible events that could happen in those situations. But even then, there's no guarantee that I can prevail because he has a lovely image at one point. He says, like, hand-to-face contact, right? If, I, if, if, if we were in the same room now and I touched your face, that is an incredibly taboo thing for people to do. If I slap you in the face, that will stun you, right? And that's a stunning thing that might make you freeze. And he says, if you're the kind of person who when you get punched or slapped or, or shoved, you just instantly feel anger and outrage, then I don't need to teach you anything. You've got everything you need because you won't stand for it. But most people will freeze. They'll be like, Shit, this doesn't happen in the world. Where is society? Where are the rules? And, and you just go, and, and your brain just gets, it, it freezes. You're like, what the hell is going on? And that is how people who seize the initiative work. They will fry your brain by transgressing a social boundary that, that conditions and determines your behavior. So Rory Miller doesn't argue that there's, he argues that martial arts try to be all things to all people. You're right. You know, like if you look at the adverts for any more, any martial arts club, any martial arts club, it'd be like, teach your child, uh, discipline, respect, um, anti-bullying, stand up to bullies, win trophies, and it's self-defense. And if you're older, it's meditation and it's yoga and it's flexibility and it's all these things. But that's just marketing because actually the martial art is going to teach you how to behave in that club. And that's all. It's that that's all it's going to teach you how, how to be at that time in that context in that place um some self-defense approaches nowadays which is uh, so the it's very interesting if you I, I, I looked at a lot of a long history of martial arts books and there's literally no psychology of any kind there's no there's none of this until about the maybe the 70s where where people start going actually you're going to have to have an attitude you're going to have to snarl and you're going to have to shout and you're going to have to do all this kind of stuff. Whereas before that, it was just like learn boxing and learn quarter staff and, and, and you've got everything you need, right? Um, so so I'm not, I, I don't want to misrepresent Rory Miller. It's, it's actually, his position is quite subtle and complex and it's like you train for a scenario that increases the likelihood that you might function within that scenario, but there's always a flaw in your training. The flaw in, in say, point like, say, karate or taekwondo training is the distance is false and it's sparring. But you have to have a flaw, otherwise you'll kill or damage your opponent. When I train with you, I cannot punch you full force in the face with no gloves on. I can't do that. I can't stick my fingers in your eyes. I can't... Because I lose my training partner, right? We just can't do that. So you modify your training, and he calls this the, the the essential flaw, and you have to know what that is in order to be able to perhaps overcome it. So, like, I don't want to come across as a self-defense uh, instructor or expert here. I want to talk about uh, Rory Miller. The book is available online. It's a short book. You can read it in a day. It's it's a fabulous book. Um, and it is widely regarded as 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 perhaps one of the best self-defense books and it's not about techniques he's like techniques i'm not interested in techniques most self-defense books go well then you jab them in the eyes and hit them in the throat and knee them in the balls and stamp on their foot and break their collarbone and twist their finger and all this nonsense hold your car keys in your hand and all this kind of rubbish and he's like no you've got to go nuts you have to break the psychological freeze and overcome the the, the, the chemical cocktail um so that's the difference between martial arts and real world violence is that kind of the, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? And it's happened to every one of us who's been in a, in a conflict or been ambushed by someone or approached by someone in the street. Like today I was walking through Bath, Bath City Centre, 9 a.m. Now Bath, World Heritage Site, tourist city, beautiful, lovely. And 
and there was a guy who was like, you know, maybe homeless, maybe, I don't know, a junkie. And, and he was shouting and swearing and looking at people. And, uh, and I'm like, I've spent my entire life training martial arts. And I was thinking, shit, okay, 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 what happens, what happens? What if he looks at me? What do I do? And mainly the, the question in my head is, do I engage with this lunatic or do I not? And you kind of go, hang on, I'm a 51-year-old man. I've got a job. I've got kids. I'm not engaging with this man. But then part of you, and you start, I start the adrenaline start, and you start to get the this kind of situation going on. Nothing has happened. He wasn't even looking at me. But I'm like, would I be able to move? Would I be able? Like, I know how to hit someone in the face or drop them to the ground or, or any number of things. Would I now do that? It's an incredibly difficult line to cross. Especially when you're 51 years old with a mortgage and a wife and kids and you're a professor. And <laughs> it's just like, so many voices in your head. Sorry. Or maybe just my head. <laughs> yes, someone from the online audience has raised his hands since <clears throat> the time. long time. Robert Richter. <laughs> Please. Uh, audio is not on. We cannot hear you. <coughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, I, I want to put another martial art into the equation because I also trained when I was a youth, uh, Shotokan Karate, but then I was in the 90s. I lived in Brazil, Salvador de Bahia, and trained the old Capoeira Angola and was in, in this culture. And um, from the European standpoint, one can say, okay, this is also some kind of Orientalism from the concept, uh, how we deal with it, uh, what's the culture around it. Uh, but it's also very interesting uh, from the uh, side of understanding the, the Asian martial arts. For me, it was like this because I, I could understand more uh, maybe what you call sublime also uh, implies some kind of flow experience or uh, maybe it's uh, also um, includes some kind of uh, ritualistic uh, transcendent of self which uh, helps you then um, in situation uh, to react in a good way. And I can only say it's total right because I lived in Latin America some years in very dangerous situation and I was attacked and, and, and robbed and all this situation. And uh, the main thing is that you react in a, in, in a, in, in a way that's appropriate in, and, and very quick. Yeah, and and that's the main thing. And uh, yes, that's and often uh, that you that makes you that makes you free. But I'm also thinking this uh, sublime uh, because I'm I'm reading just in a moment Judith Butler, and she said in in because uh, from the left they say you have to defend against violence. Uh, she means also more. Uh, principle uh, against uh, violence in, from institution and so on. But uh, the argument from her is that whose self is defending? Mm -hmm. who's, who is it that's defending? And, and maybe um, that's one point, but the other point, it, uh, it's maybe that what, what you said, in the moment uh, there is, you really have to, to drop to drop the thing and, and react. And everyone who, for example, got to an accident, he will also know uh, in first aid, there are people who freeze and mm. act. So it, it happens, it's actually a human thing in many situations. Yeah. And yeah. combined in with the training of the flow experience, that can be a, a special uh, transcendence into some kind of, uh, of sublime. I, I'm... Yeah. This is also my experience, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I, I agree with every single thing that you've said. And that's another, uh, so the, the, the sublime in theory, the different theories of the, the sublime, 
um, it's not just about that that kind of magnificent storm or terrifying situation. It's also there are also a kind of conceptualizations of the sublime which are precisely the flow. And I think that if you look into certain types of practice, and, and if I limit myself kind of relatively arbitrarily to, say, to martial arts, whether Asian or not, and attendant practices, like, for example, maybe the kind of Kundalini yoga or, or Qigong, right, where you, or meditation or different breathing practices like, the, say, the Wim Hof method breathing practice, all of these things induce different sorts of states that you can call sublime these different sublime states. Um, and this, we can expand the concept of the sublime, that there's um, at least more than one author ha has said, well, you know, like you've got the sublime, which is the kind of high point of the traditional kind of romantic sublime, which is chaos and, and, and power and magnificence of the universe and, and, and God or, or the Tao or something like that. And then you've got more conflictual everyday ones. And then you've got kind of, Everything is perfect, like a flow state, this kind of flow state of the sublime. Um, and I, I agree with what you say about reactions. Um, uh, that's, that's a different realm of conversation. And I also want to reiterate that I don't necessarily think Orientalism is always a bad thing. I think that Orientalism reflects a kind of structure of desire and fantasy. Um, and you can be, you know, Orientalism... And this is Edward Said always said, the Orientalists aren't racists. You know, his book, Orientalism, is about the people who study the East. And these scholars love that. They love the East. So when we do, if we do Shotokan, if we do Tai Chi, if we do whatever, and you see the same discourse in Capoeira. In Capoeira, you have a kind of fantasies about African origins. Um, and there's also class and also race discourses in there. But these are different species of kind of structures of desire. Like, you know, you want to identify with the group, which brings us to Judith Butler. And Judith Butler's book, uh, the one on violence, is, is okay, is good. And I absolutely agree with everything she says. But what I really disagreed with in that book is that she talks about the physical blow as, as the, the exemplary example of violence. It's like, but it's so many other things too. Well, you know, there's so many other things going on in in that, but um, I guess that's another that's another discussion too. I agree with everything you say, and it's thank you for pointing out that there are a range of different, potentially what you would call sublime states, repetition, reiteration. You know, so the philosopher Slav, um, not Slavoj Žižek, um, Peter Sloterdijk, even says like when you go for a run. If you get up and go for a run, you're a different person when you come back because the repetitive movement, you connect with your breath, you connect with the rhythm, you connect with your feet, that, that it, it puts you into a different state. We could argue if we wanted to, that's a sublime state. We don't have to. But certain practices like in, in like, like Kalari Payatu, that, there's, there's what, that, that trains specifically to attain sublime states in Qigong, you would tra you train to attain sublime states in the Wim Hof, you know Wim Hof breathing method, and and cold immersion. That's about generating a situation which could be called sublime. I I'm not trying to sell this concept. <laughs> it's like I'm not like a sublime salesman, right? But I just think that this connection hasn't doesn't seem to have been made by many um, people really who are writing about things like violence and non-violence. There's this extra psychological dimension in the middle, which is the person, their identity, their investments, their fantasies, um, and so on. When you said the physical blow is not only exemplary violence, it is more than that. Uh, could you continue on this issue? What is it uh, additional to violence? Well, so, so, um, if you, so Judith Butler's recent book on violence, she, violence. yeah, the force of nonviolence, the force of nonviolence. That's it, okay. And it's it's an interesting book, and and it's very 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 Judith Butler. It's very kind of post structuralist and everything. But what what I I didn't like about it was that for for someone for someone like Judith Butler who is 
steeped in the world of deconstruction you know she 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 was like her her work although she tends to attribute credit to people like Michel Foucault very deconstructive what she does not deconstruct at any point is her first image in that book she begins the book by saying we tend to think of violence as the physical blow between two people Boom. That, that's what we think and she then goes on but of course violence is so many other things institutional violence structural exclusion violence to the environment blah, 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 blah. and so what she's asking us to do is to not think in the individualist terms of like single free agents in the world she's she's against that um she's more for the kind of institutional hegemonic basis of society but what she does is say we've got to displace the image of the blow as the exemplary image of violence but then she doesn't even talk about the blow she just leaves it hanging there so if we were like Roland Bart we go it's it this becomes the myth this is like this is like Roland Bart's woodcutter myth it's like th this person who is it's like the the fist in the face even though she says we we need to think we need to displace this from our central image of violence, she just leaves it there. So that means that, okay, we can think about institutions as violence, structural racism, institutional racism, blah, 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 homophobia, transphobia, sexism, right, etc. We need to think about these as violence. I think we're all fine with that. Uh, well, not all of us, but like left-leaning kind of academics are, we get that. But what she is saying then is that, that, she's kind of implying in this silence around the, the fist in the face that it's that it is violence that it is the exemplary image of violence but i mean i've been punched in the face probably millions of times right definitely thousands of times and very few of those were violent right they were technical they were aesthetic they were for a joke they were fun they were training they were teaching me something Right. They were like, so, for instance, there was one time I was doing a screamer sparring with my instructor and he punched me and it jarred my neck. And I was like, oh, oh. and he said, what? Where does it hurt? I said, it just hurts there. So he punched me in this side of the face. We went, there you go. Balanced it out. And we laughed. And so, like, he punched me in the face. It hurt. And I was like, oh, so he punched me in this side. So I was balanced. Right. I mean, that's that's not violent. Well, I mean, it is. But it, there. Are, so when I, I began, I said, I think that. Violence is a good descriptive term. It's not a good analytical term. There's so much more going on in that situation. And I've, I've always, I think, I've been hugely influenced for the last, I don't know how many, many years, at least 10 years, by an essay by Ray Chow. Um, uh, and Ray Chow, in an essay called uh, The Dream of a Butterfly, says... We shouldn't just look at films for Orientalism or for racism or for sexism. He said we've known for so many years that like Western representations of East Asia are Orientalist. Like, yeah, all right, big deal. We can find that anywhere. Look at any Disney film, any Hollywood film. Look at The Last Samurai. Oh, it's Orientalist. That shouldn't be our conclusion. That should be our starting point. And the real question is, why is it Orientalist? What else is going on? So, yeah. We have a fight. I punch you in the face. You, all right. It's violent. But what else is going on? What else? Bonding, hierarchy, friendship, institutional value. Are we? Where? Where? where maybe we're. Maybe we're preserving a cross-cultural technique because I've punched you in a specific way. Boom. Maybe I've used this technique. This is from Xing Yi. This is from Muay Thai. There's more than it being violent. There's also the kind of like we are we the technical practitioner is the embodiment of cultural knowledge, in in certain way, you know. Um, so th th I think that's what interests me, and I think that um, Judith Butler's book on the force of nonviolence is kind of boring and predictable. Um, it, like it just like we know this. We've known this stuff for so very long. So what's the most interesting thing about the book? To me, it's that she does never, ever, ever stop to think about what else is going on in a punch.
<laughs> which might be me projecting my own interests onto a text. And I'm sure that we could have a really interesting conversation about that. And she wouldn't be simplistic about it at all. She would probably blow my mind in certain ways. I actually emailed her after reading that book and said, would, would you like to come on the Martial Arts Studies podcast? And of course, she very politely completely ignored my email, which I think was the decent thing to do. Yeah. Also discussing is, is consensual violence. Yeah. It is different if the framing is in sport. Now, uh, there's one question that has been posted. Uh, so, but Milena Bista, hi Paul. I'm, yeah. I, I need to uh, leave in time. That's why I'm leaving my question in the chat. Okay. The, it makes a contribution to your search for book that, to the book project. If not, just uh, let's scroll down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see it. So, so uh, <laughs> I, I'm slowly. Listening. Yeah. So um, the key concept in the beginning. But while I was listening to your talk, I lost what the concept does for you. Why is it reorienting violence and not other things such as martial art or orientalism? Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I guess that in in this context, um, the reason why I'm focused on the reorientation of violence is to counteract the idea that um, martial arts or self-defense training are violent or are violence in some way. And I, I'm interested in the, 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 the reorientation of violence, the way that the way that these these practices spring up, maybe as a response to the threat of violence, or as a desire in terms of a desire to be able to dispense violence, but they become completely reoriented. Sometimes they become orientalist. Sometimes they become aesthetic. Sometimes they become highly cultural. Um, you know, so you can look at many. You can look at. You could think about martial arts as the reorientation of violence into into different forms. You know, a, a practice like Tai Chi. Is, is is very much about violence. It's or, that all of the techniques are arguably legitimate functional martial techniques, but they're highly aestheticized, highly culturalized techniques. So Tai Chi isn't isn't violent in any way, um, but it's very much about violence. But I, I'm interested in the way these things morph into different things. Um, I was going to use the title something like Metamorphosis of Martial Arts. Um, kind of like the the Kafka kind of image of like metamorphosis um, or the Ovid, um, but I'd used that in an article already, so I can't use the t the idea of metamorphosis, the way things just change from one thing to another thing. So yeah, it's just it's more about a kind of principle, the principle of change, which you could draw yin yang, if you wanted, um, or you could think about Hegelian kind of dialectical, uh, the dialectical movement of of history in some way. I don't know. But it's just a really interesting idea, I think. The, the concept interests me. She's gone now, but it, this is recorded, so hopefully... She, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we all should visit your uh, your podcast. <laughs> yeah, you. but visit the conference as well. So the, the podcast, you can find that anywhere. I mean, just it, it's on Spotify and, and, and iTunes and things and Google, I think, uh, called the Martial Arts Studies podcast. But... Um, come to the conference, man. So we're having a, a this year's conference is in Sheffield, in 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 July. Uh, Sheffield's a fabulous city. It's I mean Sheffield has a bad reputation. It's kind of got a stigma like working class northern town. It's actually beautiful, really cool city. Come come to the conference. You'd be welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, I... I think it's time we must finish. It was a fascinating conversation, and thank you for your time. We had already an uh, exchange on these issues a long time before, uh, before your talk, and I hope that we will continue. If I got some ideas, I will contact you. Yeah, I mean, any, if anyone wants to email me, I mean, my, my email is easy enough to find. It's just bowmanp at cardiff.ac.uk. Um, yeah, thank you for um, giving me an opportunity to talk about all these jumbled and tangled ideas. Mm -hmm.